Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On a beautiful fall day in Southern California. It's better to be here than in Chicago. <laughs> At least for today. On behalf of the Advisory Council on Climate, Culture, and Inclusion, I want to welcome each of you to a special occasion that brings together the campus community, the What Matters to Me and Why series. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm a member of the Department of History. But I'm here today as the chair of the organizing committee for this series. And like most community uh, initiatives, it does take a village to put together this wonderful series that was launched last year. So I'd like to take my MC's prerogative and to have members of the What Matters to Me and Why series please stand to be acknowledged. series is to build and strengthen bonds between members of the campus community, students, staff, and faculty. And in bringing us together, the goal is to foster understanding about how we in our individual ways embrace UCI values. Now, I'm not going to test you to see if you know what the seven UCI values are because it is lunchtime and this isn't class time. But I just want to recite them because they do matter, and I'm sure they matter to you. These UCI values are respect, intellectual curiosity, integrity, commitment, empathy, appreciation, and fun. I like the last one a lot. <laughs> In this spirit, I want to start a slightly new tradition during this series and to invite each of you to take a moment or two to say hello to your neighbor on your left or right. <laughs> Before I turn the program over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan Fang, uh, who is a committee member, and he and John Scooper brought this wonderful idea to the attention of the Chancellor and to the Advisory Council. Before I turn the program over to Jonathan, I just want to remind you of four things to keep in mind. First, the event will be recorded. And during the question and answer segment, you're really encouraged to speak clearly and loudly so your voice will be recorded and people can hear you. Second, complete the audience survey at the conclusion of the event. It's real important. We want your feedback. In particular, we want to know if you have suggestions for future speakers, whether they be faculty or staff. We really do want your input. We also like to know if you'd like to volunteer. Third, please discard your lunch boxes. We want to be good stewards of this room in Humanities Gateway. And finally, please consult the What Matters to Me and Why website, because we'll be announcing our speaker for January uh, in the new year. With that, I'd like to invite my colleague, Jonathan Fenn. Well, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today. The speaker is uh, Professor Nicole Mitchell, who is a uh, professor in the School of the Arts, Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Uh, professor Mitchell came here fairly recently, um, a couple of years ago from Chicago, where she spent a good chunk of her life and uh, established her career. 
He is renowned as a, um, I mean, a triple threat, a quadruple, quintuple threat, or something like that. He's a renowned flutist, uh, soloist, band leader, composer, and of course educator in her role here at UC Irvine. She has won many awards, recognized uh, around the world as one of the top uh, creative flutists in her generation. She's uh, been named the top flutist in John Beat Jazz Critics Poll uh, four years running. I think the streak is not over yet, there's still more to come probably. She was one of the inaugural winners of the Doris Duke Artist Award just recently. And she has uh, just performed and uh, uh, led to acclaim all over the world. I have a lot of quotes here from the press, but I won't read them all. Let me just say, um, maybe read one of them, which I found particularly interesting. Uh, this is from uh, Richard Marcus, a uh, critic. He says, I can honestly say I've never heard anything quite like Nicole Mitchell's Black Earth Strings before. The fusion of classical, jazz, contemporary composition, avant-garde jazz, and traditional rhythms bound together by a spirit of adventure and a willingness to take chances make them one of the most exciting and interesting combos of musicians that you're liable to hear in any genre. So with that, let me introduce Professor Mitchell. <laughs> Good afternoon, all of you. Thanks for coming today. So, let me turn my microphone on so maybe you can hear me a little better. How's that? Is it any better or is it about the same? It's good. Okay, cool. I'm here. I mean, I was very honored to be invited to do this talk today. And when I thought about what matters to me, the first thing that came to my mind is this idea of endless possibility. Now, we might think of that in terms of science, you know, but for a musician to talk about that idea might be unusual. Um, but I'll tell you where it started. It started when I was a little kid, and my mom was a self-taught visual artist, and she liked to make paintings, and she would do some semi-realistic paintings, but she would also add some aspects of it that really just came from her imagination. And this idea of kind of blending the known or the familiar with the unknown was something that she was attracted to. I was really inspired by that and also inspired by this idea of a blank canvas. Because with a blank canvas, you can put what you know you know, what we live, you know, the reality that we experience. And you can also put something that's never been seen before, you know. And that idea actually became a survival tactic for me because I was living in Syracuse. I was born in Syracuse, New York. I was pretty comfortable there. But then we actually moved here to Orange County when I was eight years old. We moved to Anaheim, California. And actually, this is actually probably one of my first times really talking publicly about this experience. But when I was eight, we moved to Anaheim. And this is 1976. You can do the math and figure out how old I am if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, it was really kind of the beginning of integration. And my family was one of the first African-American families to move in this area where we moved to. My parents had this idea that maybe their children could have an easier time. And I'm going to say that, I'm going to kind of break the details down. Not only were we African American, but I think my parents actually thought, because I was light skinned, that maybe they wouldn't know what race I am, and I would just completely blend into the Disneyland life you know, of, of Southern California, if I just didn't, if then nobody said what I was, you know, but actually that's not what happened. <laughs> um, what happened was um, there was a lot of hostility that my family and I had to deal with. And as a child, I found myself walking down my own block, just houses away from my own house, and being confronted by neighbors coming out of their house, storming out of the house, telling me, you have to move because you're downgrading my property value by standing in front of my house. You know, or I was called the N-word and I asked my parents, what is that? What does that mean? And 
silence. They didn't know what to do. I think they were dumbfounded. They didn't realize what they were getting us into <clears throat> as parents. So needless to say, um, my experience, my first experience in Orange County was not a pleasant one. And um, I dealt with a daily battle of not non-acceptance and hostility. Um, and part of it was for being black. Another part of it was just because I just happened to be a little bit different than other kids. Um, and uh, that was a struggle for me. But going back to that blank canvas and this idea of endless possibility, that became my survival. Because with that, I, I really realized that even in spite of the reality that I was in at this moment, that it wasn't the only reality. First of all, I can create my own reality through art. Through music, I could make a whole sound world that I could feel completely joyous in and celebrate you know, all of the things I discovered, the beauty of nature, and my love for other people you know, within this sound world that I created with music. And also, I realized that as an individual, I had some power to make a difference in my own life and maybe the lives of others in spite of what it seemed from the outside that I could actually, with my own thoughts and my own intentions, I could make some type of change with my actions um, and my intent. And, and I, you know, actually I was just asked a question um, maybe 30 minutes ago about you know what you know in in terms of an experience in, of diversity what came to mind and what came to mind was this you know the experience I'm talking about how did I problem solve this was a problem right as a child every time I walked out of my house I said to myself today's going to be different you know today people are going to like me and I'm sure you know most kids most of us as children dealt with this, but in a different way. Each one of us with our own challenges, you know, we all had that challenge, but how do you overcome that? You know, you tell yourself, well, sticks and stones will break my bones, you know. Sticks and stones won't break my bones. I mean, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. There you go. I had to remember. I had to get in that computer. But actually, those words are very hurtful. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Those words really hurt me, you know? But, you know, so you say, okay, I'll ignore them, I'll just pretend these words don't hurt, and then maybe it'll be okay. No, that didn't work. That didn't work at all, because it just made them attracted to doing more, more things to me. Then I said, well, maybe I'll try to be tough, I'll try to act different, I'll try to dress different, I'll try to act different, and maybe then they'll like me. No, that didn't work either. So then I said, well, maybe I'll just pretend I don't exist. I'll just try to be invisible, try to be in the corner. No, they still pointed me out. You know, that didn't work either. So actually, what did end up working was something that I, no one had ever told me to do, and I've never really heard anyone talk about. But the person would come to me, and they would start calling me names. They'd look me up and down, talk about my clothes, talk about how ugly I was or whatever. And I would just talk to them as if they were my best friend. <laughs> and, you know, like, didn't you, wasn't that cool what happened in class, you know, last period, you know, blah, 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 you know, or do you like um, drawing pictures because, you know, I really, I have these markers and blah, 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 and I would just start a whole different conversation from what they were focused on, and somehow they would forget they were supposed to hate me. <laughs> and so then they, they would actually start this engaging with me in this conversation about something completely different. And then they'd look up and say, wait a minute, I don't like you. Why am I talking to you? You know, and I was like, well, you know, I'm not so bad, you know. And really, I guess what it comes down to, if you find a way to love yourself, that's going to emanate. And then in the end, it's going gonna, it's gonna to win over <laughs> the people that may have put you in a category that have, you know, made a decision that they don't want to connect with you or accept you because we have this thing about self and other and what is this other anyway 
I mean, other is like not wanting to see yourself in this other person, but in fact, all of us are very much alike, more alike than we're different, and the differences that we have are things we need to celebrate, because those differences are what makes it exciting to meet other people, to work, to be inspired by others, and to learn. Even if it's not fun meeting someone, they might have differences we don't like, we end up learning something dealing with them, right? So. In this endless possibility idea came, wow, well, I can, I can imagine they're my friend. I can just use my imagination and pretend that they don't have this negative idea about me. And it actually worked. And so it ended up turning, turning my life around. It also gave me a confidence that it was OK to be different, because I was going to need that. I was definitely going to need that later to be strong in um, whatever it is that I was trying to do. Because I started school thinking I was going to do computer science, but ended up in the practice room 10 hours a day. So making a decision to be a musician isn't something that's necessarily you know, promising of, of you know, great <laughs> lucrativeness or anything <laughs> like that. So to have that confidence to say, well, this is what I really believe, and this is what I want to do. Having gained that from the previous experience helped a lot. The other thing about endless possibility is, you know, we think about art, we think about music. You know, a lot of you have been exposed and seen lots of visual art that can be very abstract and colorful and exciting, but not representative of anything that you know of previously. But a lot of times with music, because music is a part of all of our lives in so many different ways, there might be an expectation that music does this for me, so music needs to be in this category. Well, guess what? I'm rebelling against that, too, because I'm saying that music can be anything. Music can make us feel all the possibilities that we feel as people, all the emotional, the range of emotions that we feel the range of experiences that we feel in there, the range of expressions in nature, I'm curious about how to express that through music. So that makes my music, again, labeled as experimental. Oh boy, experimental, I don't like that. You know what I mean? So there I am in the box again. But I come out the box by saying, well, you guys like science fiction, right? Lots of us like to see movies that bring us to like a whole fantasy world or may even be scary, like a horror movie. And we go to that movie, we know it's going to be over in two hours and we'll go back to our lives. So while we're in the movie, we can experience all kinds of things that we might not want to experience in life, right? So I take on that, I, that idea with music, that I can create an experience that may be a lot different from what you're used to. I might draw you in with something familiar and then bring you and bridge you to a whole nother experience. And through the connection with science fiction with my music, which I've done several compositions connecting with the writing of Octavia Butler, the science fiction writer, or making my own science fiction writing and creating my own program from that, that it makes a connection that people can understand. Oh, now there's a purpose that they can connect to with this experimental music. And I'm actually going to be expressing that here on campus next week. I'm doing this project called Mandorla Awakening. And it's this whole sci-fi story I came up with about, first of all, how a person can have this enormous amplified impact on their planet. Like how you feel. If you feel fear or if you feel something negative, it has this huge negative effect on the lighting, on the sound, you know, on the video, in the music. And then if you feel thankfulness and positively, then all of a sudden things brighten. It's really what we actually experience in life, but we may not notice the detail of it. But it's amplified within this story of a girl and a guy who wake up in this other environment, and now they experience this new alternative reality with these Mandorlians, you know? So that's what the story is about. And it'll be in the XMPL Theater over here at Claire Trevor School of the Arts next weekend if you all want to check it out. But to exemplify this idea that I've been talking about, I thought I might just play this a little, a little bit for you.
on that same idea of endless possibility and tried to find a way to really incorporate my own approach to improvising. And I really have this fascination with getting to the edge of beauty. You know, when you get to that outer edge where you're not sure exactly if it fits your definitions of what beauty is. Because that's really you know, that's really a part of what our lives are. I mean, we have this aspect of life where we like to embrace what we're comfortable with and what we're familiar with. And then life always pushes us these unknown experiences, like these spontaneous surprises that wake us up. And, you know, sometimes they're jolting. Sometimes they're amazingly beautiful and wonderful. Um, but it's that aspect of our lives that, you know, we have this dance between the, uh, the familiar and the unknown. And so I try to do that with music because um, it's something that really fascinates me. So by adding my own voice to it, I'm also, I'm also making the presence of a woman, the evidence that a woman was there in my music because playing jazz and being an improviser is still a world very dominated by men. So for me to have the opportunity to you know, someone listens to a record and they hear my voice inside of what I'm doing. It's like, it's an empower, hopefully an empowerment in an, in the expression that, you know, I'm here, you know. <laughs> you know, I might be the only girl, but I'm here. <laughs> so that's something else, you know, I find symbolic ways of making my statements through what I do. You know, whether it's composing and making sure that I'm including, a, you know, a diverse group of musicians in the people that I choose. Like for example, the concert we're doing um, at Mandorley Awakening will have mu a music group of students, which includes undergrads, grad students, alumni, professional musicians from LA and also from other parts of the country all together in one ensemble, which is also a co-ed ensemble. That's very rare <laughs> in my, in my um, field to have that, but I try my best to, to do that with, with my projects. Um, the, other, the other thing about that is, I guess, improvisation as, as, you know, I didn't plan what I was gonna play for you, but improvisation is another way that we live. I mean, it's something that we, we do all the time when we deal with the unexpected. We might make a list of things we're gonna do, 
when we wake up in the morning, but then <laughs> by the time the day starts happening, other things pop up, right? And we have to kind of work with that and juggle that. So that improvisation aspect is something that I really enjoy in music because it allows a space to be yourself, you know, for you to really not just play what someone else wrote, even as a composer, for me to write something I wrote, but to be able to, in that second, how I feel from you, to be able to express that through the sound. Because I'm connecting, and it's like a, you know, it's a back and forth between all of your energy and the energy I'm creating through sound. It's all one thing, you know? And so I really enjoy doing that. Collaboration is another important thing to me, um, which is a wonderful thing about being in this program that I'm in on the art school. It's called ICIT, which is Integrated Composition, Improvisation, and Technology. And um, to have a team of people that are interested in these exciting things and we can work together and inspire each other, it's a really wonderful way to work. And um, hopefully in all the endeavors that you all do, you find people that you can team up with in order to solve problems. Because it's much better when you have a group of people <coughs> improvising than trying to work it out all by yourself, you know? So that's something that I've also really, really um, enjoyed and felt appreciation and thankfulness for. I'm not sure what my time is looking like, so two minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see, so what are the, like, the last thing I want you guys to know that I want to share with you? Um, I really enjoyed this whole experience and sharing with you. Um, my hope is that as a professor here, it's just my, I'm going into my third year, that I can find more ways that we can make collaboration between different departments and different schools within the university, you know, because I think that collaboration aspect is so vital and it really can just lend to like a real insight that we wouldn't have if we're all compartmentalized in what we do. You know, and so doing this project with videographer in the studio art, Ulysses Jenkins, and a choreographer in the dance program, who is also the, the chair of dance, um, Lisa Noggle, that's been kind of my first experience doing this, but I want to definitely continue that idea. And um, hopefully I, you understand where I'm coming from with this endless possibility idea, and I really enjoyed being here with you all, and hopefully you have some questions. I'd love to answer questions. Uh, as is our custom, our uh, grad student representatives, Rebecca Thompson and Daniel Payne, will handle the microphones if they're around. Uh, please speak into the microphone, ask a question. Uh, we like others to sort of participate. Uh, and the floor is now open for questions. There's one way in the back. I don't think I need a microphone. Um, I was wondering, um, I know, I'm sure there's been some studies on how music affects people emotionally. Um, and I know you talked you talk about that briefly. Um, I know I like to sing, and there's a certain feeling that I get when I sing. But there's a different feeling I get when I hear singing. And there's another feeling I get when I hear bad singing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just wondering if you personally have uh, done any studies on how perhaps your music affects people emotionally, um, how they hear it, how they feel it. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit of that with us. Well, first, actually, what you said reminded me of one other thing I wanted to share, that, and then I'll answer your question, but what you brought up about studies, that I wanted to make a statement that sometimes <coughs> statistics don't matter because, you know, we're taught and we are engaged in finding statistical evidence of things. And as a young person, when, when, you know, for the students here, a lot of times you look at the statistics of what it is you're trying to do and it almost affects your decision about what you're going to do. Like, well, only so-and-so percentage of students make it to this or only so-and-so percentage of people get to do this or whatever. And I wanted to make the statement 
that it doesn't matter, that you have to believe in what it is that you're doing and not look at the statistics. Because the statistics of me being here right now are like point zero zero, <laughs> like one seven nine something like that. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. Because first of all, I said I went to high school in Anaheim. How did I end up back here at Irvine? How did that happen? How did I? And I didn't even talk about my life in Chicago, but I just spent over 20 years in Chicago, and I'm back. I've done a circle. I've come back here. How did that even happen? You know? How did it happen that I was able? to find my voice and have the freedom to develop these dreams that I had. How did that happen? If I was looking at statistics, I might not have even tried. So I wanted to say that first. But in terms of answering your question, which um, I don't want to ignore your question, I am not, um, the, research, the music I create, I definitely think a lot about how it will impact people. And I try to hear as if I'm an audience person, even though as an artist, I know I can't totally step outside of myself to know how I'm impacting others or um, how they're receiving or interpreting what I do musically. Um, I make the effort and I make the intent. And in some ways, this is more of a kind of spiritual belief. but. I really believe in the idea of intent, that when you have an uh, intent for something, like if you have an intent, this song is going to be for healing. Or if you have an intent that this song is going to raise questions about, you know, social, you know, reality, you know, or that this project is going to, you know, make people discuss, you know, get, you know, this idea out. and. I really work from that idea, so I can't say I can prove. The only evidence that I have of what the impact is is, first of all, you know, you have your feedback from the audience. Um, your feedback when people come to you and they tell you, I felt this or I saw that visually when you were playing. And it, a, a lot of times it does happen that they're seeing or saying what it is that I did intend, which is really encouraging to me. And then the other aspect is when you have critics who also, <laughs> they will give you their feedback on, on what you did. So I hope I answered. Did I answer your question? It's close enough. OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Oh, hi. Yeah, um, the more I, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I uh, I keep thinking back to the uh, music teachers that I had when I was a kid, and uh, 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 the more I think about them, the more I realize that uh, the impact of those early teachers I had, music teachers, was decisive in my life. I'm not a musician, but uh, uh, it was uh, the few teachers uh, who taught me music uh, in various forms that uh, really changed uh, changed me in decisive ways. So can you, uh, uh, can you think back a little bit of your early uh, teachers, uh, music teachers particularly, and what, uh, what that meant to you? Wow. Well, I have to say my very first music teacher was in eighth grade because I, I wanted to play the flute in fourth grade, but my parents were like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually played air flute for four years <laughs> with the radio, pretending I was playing flute. And then finally, they decided, oh, she has some talent in visual art. We'll pay for you to get visual art lessons, you know, and buy your materials. And I was like, can you take that money and buy me a flute, you know? And they said, oh, OK, I guess. <laughs> so so the, I got the flute in eighth grade. And my first teacher in eighth grade, which I didn't even realize until many, many years later, was actually the first African American teacher I ever had. Like, so from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade, I never had an African American teacher ever. And this was the first one. But the funny thing is, like, I remember the first day of class, he was going around the students asking them, like, kind of just like inconsequential questions, like, so what's your favorite color? So, you know, um, 
how old do you have a brother or sister? You know, questions like that. And it was like 30 kids in the class, and he didn't ask, you know, I was like, when is he gonna ask me something? And then finally when he got to me, he said, do you have any relatives in the South? And I was like, what kind of question is that? <laughs> what kind of question <laughs> is that? But his, he was really kind of making a joke about me being the only black kid in the class and in a very, very nuanced <laughs> way, you know? <laughs> and so there was an encouragement that happened in that class you know, where he never doubted my ability to do things and, and stuff like that, that I think had a bit big impact on me. That was one of my first, that was my first music teacher experience. And then the other one was um, a teacher who is now at, te he teaches at UCLA um, in ethnomusicology. I think he's the most amazing jazz flute player in the world. And when I first, heard him play, I just didn't think there was anything else possible on the flute. And then um, I started taking lessons with him. I was playing music on the street, and I would save this money, and then I would go and take lessons from him, and I'd give him dimes, quarters, and nickels, and everything from, <laughs> for the lessons. And then when I played for him, at the end of every lesson, for the last 10 minutes, we would just improvise, and he wouldn't say anything. He didn't judge or critique anything I did. We just played together, and I think that was probably the most impactful experience I had with any teacher musically. And it was just playing with the teacher, you know what I mean? And like connecting, and it was like there was no, I mean, it was, it was like in an equity situation. It was no like, you're the teacher, I'm the student, and all this kind of thing. It was just like, we're just playing music together. And through his playing, you know, it, he was showing me the freedom that I probably didn't even know I had to express, you know, different things musically. So, yeah. I know it's a long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes? Yes, I just wondered, did, uh, did you have any spiritual experience or uh, uh, religious or faith experience in your life? development that uh, impacted what you do now? Definitely. Actually, um, when I was telling that story about being a little kid and dealing with being, um, you know, not being accepted or being called names, you know, and dealing with racism and all of that, I used to say, what would Jesus do? You know, <laughs> like, how do I, what do I do here, you know? But I think what came to me was, First of all, what I learned through music, when I, when I took music as my kind of like my safety, you know, to, for my place where it's like, look, nobody can do anything to me here in music, and I can create these things and they'll still be here when I come back, you know, and, you know, it's like this place, right? And I realized that um, when I'm creating, that it's an, a process where you're dealing with an intellect an intelligence that's beyond the intellectual mind. It's beyond thought, you know, and to me it's a, it's a, it's a practice. Improvisation and composition is, a, is like a spiritual practice to me where you're going inside and you're really just being open to receive, you know, you're, you're connecting with kind of like a greater consciousness and that, that music is coming through you. And it's a practice of being open for that to happen and um, to get outside of this identity of I'm this person, my name is so-and-so, this is what I do, this is my strengths, these are my weaknesses and all of that and going, forgetting all of that and just saying, wow, I'm alive and this can happen, you know, and I can just focus on this music and let the music do itself, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. We have time and for several more questions, yes. How and when did you decide to be a university professor? Oh. And spread this joy of music with others. I'll tell you, um, I, was, I was in Chicago, and I actually had a hard time with school, honestly. Like, I didn't have the straight 
narrow way with school. Like I always went to really great schools and I did well in school, but at the same time I wasn't happy. So, you know, I would move I moved. I went from UC San Diego, I went to, then to Oberlin, then I went to Chicago. And I was at this place called Chicago State University, which I ended up finishing my bachelor's there, which is not really a fancy school at all. But I was in the practice room and um, this woman came up to me and she was a professor and she was like, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in school? Like, what, <laughs> what are you doing, you know? You know, it's like, how can you be this talented and you're not doing anything? You know, I was in there practicing in the practice room, but I wasn't enrolled in school or anything. And um, she really inspired me seeing her as kind of as a mentor and seeing her doing what she was doing and the impact that she was having, the difference she was making with the other students you know, helping them to find their way. And, you know, she was someone who taught education, you know, and she taught people, she taught music students to be music teachers. And um, she was, had a real strong mission with that. So she really inspired me. Her name is Roxanne Stevenson. She's still at Chicago State University. But I ended up enrolling there and finishing my schooling and then going on and getting other degrees, after, you know, getting my master's after that. But um, at that was when I really decided you know, I'm not gonna just get this bachelor's degree, I'm just gonna keep going, and I wanna teach in the university. You know, this is what I, you know, that was how I made that decision, kind of seeing her as a role model. You know, like, I see what she's doing, like, I think I can do that too, you know? And I guess, I didn't think about it, a lot of these things are unconscious, but she was probably, she was probably the first African-American woman that I knew that was a professor in music. You know, there's not too many of them. Um, not to say that you have to see someone who's exactly, you know, within your, your background to do what you're doing, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it definitely doesn't hurt in terms of seeing the possibilities. If you can see somebody else doing it, then you feel like maybe you can do it, you know. Yes? Yeah, music has this really odd dichotomy because it's an incredibly solitary pursuit, especially when you're sort of getting ready to be good enough to actually work with other people, which at the point it becomes an incredibly collaborative effort. Yeah. So it's sort of, you know, you almost need to split personality in order to be a successful musician. So I'm um, wondering if you could discuss what your experience is in, you know, spending thousands of solitary hours in the practice room and then having to go out and deal with people and provide some Well, actually, that's what I love about music. I feel that it, in some ways it's a real balance because you spend this time by yourself, you know, in terms of creating. You have to really be by yourself. And some people can work around a lot of people talking and doing things. I'm not really good at that. I have to kind of be in a quiet place, which means sometimes getting up at four or five in the morning when it's really quiet and working. But then, once the music is finished, to be able to get together, finding the musicians you want to work with, that's the fun part. You know, I mean, sometimes it's kind of a drag being by yourself, like doing that part, but it's important, it's good, you know. I'm trying to learn to love it. <laughs> <laughs> And then when you get with the other musicians and then you start collaborating and then they interpret what you wrote and you, you know, kind of work things out where they're contributing their, you know, their inspiration, their ideas and creativity to what you're doing. That rehearsal time, that's really special. And then the last thing is when you're sharing it as a group with the audience. So there's like kind of two elements of that social aspect, which to me, you know, I think it's a great balance. It kind of, for me, I was a very shy person, and I never wanted to be a band leader. I never wanted to lead a project. I was happy to play in somebody else's band. You know, I just play the flute. I don't have to say anything, just play the flute. You know, but I had kept writing all this music, and I would bring them to the bands I was in, and they were like, Start your own band. Start your. <laughs> and I was like, oh God, do I have to? You know, and it was like, oh, you know, I literally threw up the first time that I, my first band, I started my first group, Black Earth Ensemble in Chicago, 
and I had the first concert and I went in the bathroom and threw up like in between sets like it was like oh my god this is awful you know it's just you know it wasn't something that was natural for me but that's what I love about when you find what you're passionate about whether it's music or something else it will develop you as a person I didn't know that loving playing the flute was going to make me have to tell people what to do, you know, <laughs> or even t like stand in front of you guys and talk like this. Like I didn't know that loving music was going to bring me to all these places that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with at first. So it's a good balance. Hi. Um, when you were younger and just starting in your music was somewhat experimental, were you ever discouraged to go on or was your love and passion just always pushing you forward? That's a good question. I was never um, encouraged necessarily, but I wasn't discouraged. I guess that, you know, everybody has their own kind of family life. And my, my mother passed when I was a teenager. So she being kind of a self-taught art artist that had this passion for being an artist, but didn't quite get to what, where she wanted to go, that gave me a feeling of like um, almost a mission, like I wanted to continue her path, and that made it a really strong passion to do that. Um, and then my dad was just kind of laissez-faire. He was just like, you know, as long as you do your best, you know, that's okay. He didn't say, no, you can't do that, or you need to make a living, or, you know, he didn't really do that. He just said, as long as you do your best at it. So I think that was enough you know, encouragement to help me to continue. But I didn't have anyone actually against me, you know. It was just more like nothing. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> you know. So I figured it out on my own. Yeah. We have still time for a couple more questions. Oh, OK. OK. What's the richest musical experience you've ever had? <gasps> oh my gosh. That's a good question. The richest musical experience I've ever had. <sighs> Can I say every time I play, it's a new experience, first of all. Like playing with you all has been really special. This type of formatting in this event, I've never really done before. And, you know, it's like I don't, it's not like an academic lecture, I can just be myself, and that's been a wonderful experience. Um, I think whenever I meet people that I'm really excited about, that I have, that it's like a new experience playing and making music with them, that's always super exciting to me. I was actually in New Orleans last week, and um, I did a collaboration with some musicians that I knew before that I had never actually played in that configuration. And then I also played with musicians that I had never met until that moment. We got on the stage and we performed. And I do this a lot where I'll travel somewhere, get on the stage, hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. You know, and then we start playing. <laughs> and that type of experience I think is really exciting and really, like I learn a lot. You know, I learn about people, we learn about how to negotiate, how to conversate, you know, and express yourself and also respect what someone else has to say and make space for everyone to be themselves and all of that. So I guess that's my answer for now. <laughs> Might not be the expected answer. But yeah. Well, before we close our program this afternoon, I just want to remind you of three things. First, fill out the audience survey. We really want your input. <laughs> Second, discard your lunch materials. Uh, and third, consult the webpage for what matters to me and why, and our January uh, presenter. But above all, let's give a hand to Professor Mitchell. Thank you.